Welcome to the general chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 36 to 40. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. Now let's go through the question together. In question 36, it says an equilibrium reaction will be shifted towards the products when the temperature is increased if blank. We have an equilibrium reaction. It's going to shift towards the products if temperature is increased. That can only happen in which case. So this question is talking about Le Chatelier's law, which is saying that if you increase the concentration of something, it's going to shift the reaction in the other way. So for example, if we have A plus B goes to C, if we increase the concentration of A, we have too much A, it's going to go in the other direction, and therefore the reaction is going to, the equilibrium is going to shift towards the right. So let's just draw equilibrium arrows. It's going to shift towards the right to give us more C. If we increase the concentration of C, it's going to go the other way, and it's going to give us more of the reactants. However, if we introduce temperature now, how do you think it behaves? It behaves the same way. If we had something which was like this, if heat was a reactant and we increased the temperature, that means that we have more heat. Heat is required for this reaction to go, but now we increase the temperature, more heat is provided, it's going to go to the right. So heat, you can think of it as either a product or a reactant, just like other reactants and products that you normally think about in a reaction when we're talking about equilibrium reactions and Le Chatelier's principle. So this equilibrium reaction shift towards the product and a temperature increase, that can only happen if heat is a reactant. If heat was a product, if heat was produced as a result of this reaction, then increasing heat would actually shift the reaction back towards the reactants. So therefore it has to be heat as a reactant. Option A is saying if the concentration of products is greater than the concentration of reactants. No, it's not about the concentration of products or reactants. We're not talking about these things, we're talking about heat. Option B is saying the concentration of reactants is greater, so this is flawed because it's talking about the concentrations of the actual species partaking in the reaction rather than the heat. Therefore, we can eliminate A and B. Option C is talking about the reaction being either exothermic or endothermic, and we proved that for the reaction to shift towards a product, it has to be endothermic, me endothermic, meaning endo, meaning that heat is required and it needs to be inputted to have the reaction go forward. And exo would mean that heat is released and heat's a product. So C we can el eliminate and D is the correct answer. In question 37, it says the vapor pressure of an unknown pure solid, sorry, pure liquid is 28 millimeters of mercury. If four moles of non-volatile solute are dissolved into the liquid, to form seven moles of the solution. What is the vapor pressure of the solution? So we have an unknown pure liquid. Here is the pure vapor pressure. Now we have four moles of a non-volatile solute. They're dissolved into that liquid. We have seven moles of solution. What is the vapor pressure of this solution now? That's what we're asking for. And this requires us to use Routes law. And what this tells us is that the vapor pressure of a solution is equal to the vapor pressure of that pure solvent multiplied by the mole fraction of the solvent. So what that means is take the vapor pressure, if we just had the solvent itself and we had none of the solute dissolved, multiply it now by the vapor pressure, sorry, the mole fraction, which is how much of the solution is just the solvent and not the solute. In this case, we're told that 28 millimeters of mercury went in here. And the mole fraction, what is that? We know that we have seven moles of solution and we were told that four moles of non-volatile solute were added. So the solvent has to be the remaining three. So we multiply by three divided by seven and we should get 12. So A is the correct answer here. The other answers would be incorrect. D is saying there's not enough information to determine the answer. That's also incorrect. 
So what's going to happen here is make sure that you use this equation. Make sure that you don't accidentally add the solute. It should be solvent. That's the mole fraction that you're looking at, not anything else. So if you add some solute and it's non-volatile, that's going to decrease the vapor pressure. It's not going to increase it. So that's why we can remove 49 and it's not 16, it's 12. In question 38, we're asked which of the following is true regarding a molecule with sp3 hybridized orbitals. Option A is saying its structure is always tetrahedral. That's not correct. For example, we can have NH3, which has sp3 hybridized orbitals, but that's trigonal pyramidal. So we're talking about sp3 hybridized orbitals. What is true regarding them? And B likewise is incorrect. Its structure is always trigonal planar. Both of these are saying it's always something, but there are some ex exceptions to this rule that you should know. And same thing with C. It's saying the angles will consistently be 109.5. No, the angles can be different depending on what groups are attached to the central atom and how much repulsion they have between them and how much steric hindrance they have as well. And based on all of this, as well as lone pairs, we can have different or different geometric shapes and then also different angles between the groups. So D is the best answer. It says its structure is determined by the groups bound to the central atom. This is a statement which is true. Also keep in mind, this is a statement which is the most all encompassing. It's not as strict as the other ones. It's not something that's definitely just taking one viewpoint and saying it's always this, it's always that. If you see an answer like that on the MCAT, often that will be incorrect because that's too rigid. You need an answer that's more flexible and that's an easy way to answer questions on the MCAT. If you see something that's way too strong, you say, okay, no, that's way too strong. It's not something that always is like this, so I can eliminate that answer. Of course, there are situations in which that strong answer is correct, but often a shortcut is to see that that one is incorrect and look at the other one that's not as strong and is it an actual correct statement, then yeah, there's your answer. In question 39, it says in a closed system with constant temperature, pressure can be plotted against volume in a PV diagram. Given this, which of the following is not true? So we're talking about a closed system, we're talking about constant temperature, and we're talking about a PV diagram. What is not true? So our PV diagram can look something like this, pressure on one axis, volume on the other, an isothermal reaction can look like this. In this case, we're talking about an expansion. So you can see that pressure is going down because say we have a balloon, for example, or any system, it's expanding, pressure is going down, volume is going up. It's isothermal, which means constant temperature. So something could happen. Like for example, if we decrease the pressure, normally that would also decrease temperature. But in this case, what we're doing is we're changing this state of the reaction step by step and whenever a small decrease in pressure happens and an increase in volume if there's a change in temperature we either add or remove heat so in this case we would add some heat and that would get you back to the same temperature so we're doing this in small steps and always adding heat to make sure that the overall temperature of the system stays constant so in option a it says the amount of energy expended by the system can be estimated by an area on the graph that is true if we take the area under the curve, that is going to give us work. So that's something that's true. We're looking for something that's not true. Option B is saying the relationship between pressure and volume would always be linearly decreasing. That is something which is not true. Therefore, it's the correct answer. You can see right here, it's not linear. If we were allowing temperature, temperature to also change, then maybe it would be linear. But in this case, we're talking about something that's isothermal, meaning constant temperature. And because of this temperature that we're constantly adding, it makes it a hyperbolic relationship rather than linear. In question C, it says a change in internal energy is equal to zero. This is correct. Internal energy is a state function. It's dependent on temperature. And if we're not having any change in the temperature, the internal energy of this system is not changing either. So you should know for an isothermal reaction, internal energy is zero. So that is something that's true. We're looking for something that's not true. And option D is saying an appropriate example that can be plotted in this PV diagram is an ideal gas in a container, which is in this constant temperature environment, which is allowed to expand slowly. That's exactly what we do have. We have something which is ideal. So this doesn't always apply for something that's a real, a real gas. We're talking about an ideal gas 
and we're talking about constant temperature environment and we're expanding it. That's the example that I showed you and it's definitely an example which makes sense. So it's a true statement. B is the only one that's not true. In question 40, it says a weak basis when titrated with, with strong acids have an equivalent point which deviates from 7, which is pH neutral. The reason for this phenomena is what? We're talking about weak bases titrated with strong acids and then their equivalent point deviates. What's the reason for this? So normally an equivalent point is when you have enough of the acid added or enough of whatever else you're titrating in added so that you have this one-to-one -one ratio of the acid and the base and everything's fully crunched. So you add enough acid to fully protonate how much base you have. That would give you the equivalent point. That should be at seven. But in this case, we're talking about a weak base and a strong acid. If you have a strong acid, the stronger thing is going to win out. If we have both a strong acid and a strong base, then they're gonna cancel each other out and have seven as their equivalence point, pH neutral, but you should know the relationships when we have different types of acids or bases. In this case, we have a weak base, strong acid. It's gonna be more of an acidic solution, so it's gonna be lower than seven. So you can think about it as if we have some strong acid that's protonating the weak base, the conjugate base, the resulting base after protonation, from, sorry, the conjugate acid, the resulting acid after their protonation of the weak base is going to be itself a strong acid. So weak bases have a conjugate strong acid. That acid itself in solution might eventually go and deprotonate, and therefore you have less of this conjugate acid that you expected, and you have more of this weak base. So since you have less of the conjugate acid, you're gonna have a deviation from this equivalent point. Option A is saying at the equivalence point, there will be fewer hydrogen ions than expected. No, it's not the hydrogen ions that are less than expected. You added enough to actually fully protonate the weak base. B is saying at the equivalence point, there will be no protons in solution. That doesn't make sense. No, there are a lot of protons floating around. There's nothing that made them kind of disappear. Even if something was deprotonated, they would still float around. The protons in solution, they won't just disappear. Option C is saying at the equivalence point, the base will have a lower concentration than expected. No, it's going to be a higher concentration than expected. The strong acid that was formed has actually deprotonated. So we have more of the, the base. We have, as option D says, the conjugate acid, less of it. The conjugate acid will exist in a lower concentration than, than expected. This is what causes the deviation from neutral pH. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here, as well as in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions just like this and go through all the answers, explaining why each one is correct or incorrect. Other than that, make sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you.